but Mitch, <laughs> Mitch, <laughs> Jalen <Jill and> Carter. <laughs> <laughs> He obviously did something, the Giants' defense in that game, to stop the offense from working. Do you have any idea what it was? Um, that was the biggest anticlimax um, since uh, since the Barbie film. I mean, shout out to whichever surgeon and doctor have, have worked on him over over the summer and since his injury, because you you need to go right to the top of your industry, um, because the, the the guy looks like fucking Superman out there. I think he's doing a superb job, and uh, as long as he's fitting in there, I think I think we'll see other people having a much easier game. I have written a little thesis on, on what the defend, the perfect defensive line looks like. Ladies and gentlemen, Seahawks and football fans everywhere, a very warm welcome back to the We Talk Seahawks podcast. I hope you're all doing well. Um, Seahawks played this weekend. I can't really remember who they played against because I didn't see an awful lot of them. Were, they, did, were we playing another team? Was it Was it the Giants? Mitch, I think it was the Giants. Was yeah. it the Giants. I think it was twenty-four to three or something like that. But I don't really remember seeing much of the other teams. But it kind of felt like we were just playing against Casper's Ghost. So I, I mean, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I'm sure you all did as well. Um, twenty-four to three. My word. Um, how about that Seahawks defense at the offense on a night where the offense needs a bit of slack picking up. Um, they need bailing out a little bit, which is usually the other way around. But for the first time this season, other than maybe the Rams game, but the defence was also pretty crap in that game too. The offence says to the defence, come and win us a game, come and bail us out, will you? And what do the defence do? They go and get 11 sacks um, and and all the rest in between, all the fun stuff in between that we're going to get into. Um, but yeah, man, what a, what a performance. The Seahawks are 3-1 and one into the bye week now, looking ahead to that big, big game against the Bengals after the bye week. Will it be Joe Burrow? Will it not? Um, but whatever it, whatever it will be, whoever it will be, the Seahawks are putting themselves in a fantastic position for early seeding and playoff implications in the NFC. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, honestly, I can't wait to get into this this uh, this Seahawks performance tonight because it was it was pretty special. It, it uh, it's my favourite game of the season so far. I'm sure it's pretty much all of yours as as well. Um, but Mitch, how are you, mate? I'm very good. good. Uh, predi- predictably very good after a week like that in the NFL. We saw uh, a pretty average uh, offensive line for the Giants. You'd say. Mm get absolutely torn to ribbons by pretty much any one of our defensive players that decided to uh, to blitz and mm-hmm. uh, and I'm all for it yeah it was um it, i mean i'd al- i'd almost be embarrassed if i was a Seahawks defender and i didn't get a sack in that giants game because i mean everyone everyone in the mam got a sack for the Seahawks or, or everyone in the mam got a got a play of some note for the Seahawks I mean, it was just everyone on that defence just feasted on that Giants offence and that Giants offensive line, which we're going to get into. Um, Pez can't be with us tonight. He is apparently packing to go to Amsterdam tomorrow. Um, he's obviously getting on the good stuff because he's uh, he's off to celebrate some uh, some good Seahawks performance or, or to maybe sort of drown his sorrows or spliff his sorrows away that the fact that Jackson Smith and Jigba still isn't being used in the Seahawks offense either way I'm sure he's gonna have a great time in Amsterdam um, but understandably can't be with us tonight but we are going to crack on we're going to start with the offense and we're probably not going to spend well for, for right or wrong we might spend a bit more time on the on the offense um, than, than maybe you'd think um, because it was a pretty poor performance from the offense I must say put it this way Mitch the Seahawks got 13 first downs. Giants got 17. And yet the Giants scored three points and we got 24. And yet they got considerably more first downs than, than, than the Seahawks offense, which is just, it was just a really weird offensive performance. Geno Smith, 13 for 20 for 110 yards passing and a touchdown. Obviously had to leave the game for a certain point due to a knee injury, but it looks like everything's okay with him. Um, and then Drew Locke came into the game pretty much half Geno Smith's yardage on six uh, attempts. Two were completed. Obviously, that one big monster one for no offense for 63 yards. Um, yeah, it was it was a really weird game for the offense. I, yeah. I, I don't really know what happened. Again, you've got the offensive line sort of banged up that, that we that we know we've got with with Charles Cross and Abe Lucas out there um, and, and, and Stone Forsyth and, and Curran having to come in. Um, but 
I thought, all right, that 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 wasn't that hadn't stopped us last week, and then this week, uh, like it, I, I didn't expect it to stop us again. And for whatever reason, that the 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 offense just was not firing. It just wasn't clicking. It just wasn't working. Um, the ground game was Ken Walker again, seventeen carries, seventy nine yards, and a touchdown. I mean, just absolute lead back numbers all the way workhorse as he is. Um, he he picked up the slack, but other than that. Like I say, no fun leading leading the receptions with 63 yards. Tyler Lockett coming in second with 54. DK Metcalf being held for just 34 yards. Sach- well, not Sach- Sharman, Jack- Jackson Smith and Jigba, three receptions for five yards, almost more receptions than yards. Um, just a really, really weird, really weird offensive performance. That I just don't really know. I don't know how to sum it up. I don't know what to, where to go with it because I just don't know what happened. I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't, pre, I can't present a, you know, conclusive reason for, for what happened. It was just, just a really off night. I don't know whether you with your expert eyes, Mitch found anything that I couldn't see, but it just seemed like for just for whatever reason, the, the offense just met its match a little bit with that Giants front line, even though they didn't dominate that's what I'm saying. Like it didn't feel like the Giants front front seven dominated our offensive line, but they obviously did something. The Giants defense in that game to stop the offense from working. Do you have any idea what it was? Uh, not not nothing conclusive necessarily. But what one thing I would say is that an a, an, an enormous difference between um, the Giants quarterback and the Seahawks quarterback is that only one of those values ball security, mm-hmm. and and honestly. Um, Daniel, well, I think Jones in in general has had uh, a lot of fumbling issues, but that night we saw two very bad uh, interceptions from a quarterback standpoint. Um, the one to Devin Witherspoon, he's Devin Witherspoon's done very well, but at the same time, he's he's not remembered the the, the wide receiver's route being mm. a comeback r- uh, route, and he's thrown it where he was going, uh, you know, the direction that the wide receiver was running instead of where he was going to stop and turn and come back to complete. So mm. that was terrible, and the one to, to Diggs, I don't know what he sees. Um, honestly, yeah. it was it almost looks like he thought Diggs had a had a giant shirt on because it was that terrible. Um, we see we see Gino some games marching the ball up the field quite well when he's supported by the run game, and some games we see him not taking uh, chances on on what look like open receivers when we've got a chance to carry on marching the ball down the field. However, I do value his uh, his high level of accuracy combined with his um, his heightened sort of importance on on ball security. Um, so, yeah, it looked a bit dysfunctional. We did. We only saw two tight end catches in the whole game, and both of them were to Fant. We didn't see. We didn't. We saw targets for Disney that didn't get there. There was a few. It was the one that was side armed. I think that nearly mm-hmm. got intercepted by by Thibodeau. I think was aimed at a, a tight end, mm-hmm. and there was one that was aimed at. Um, Disley, which was the one where it got batted back and he caught his own reception and then ran to the sideline and that bulldog, that that bulldog from behind on the on the um on the outside, um the you know, the play that, that hurt uh Gino um happened as a result of that. So there were targets for the tight ends that didn't happen um for, for those reasons. Uh, and there were targets for uh, Jackson Smith and Jigba, who had who had a, a drop. I think that was might have been Locke that threw that. Um, and there was also one for Charbonnet on an out route um, where the ball was thrown slightly behind him, and he's reached backwards to take the catch. And in reaching backwards rather than in front of him, um, has reached back towards the defender, and the defenders managed to get a hand on it and and take it out. So there's drop. There's the the, the Jackson Smith and, Dr- and Jigba drop is kind of on him. It was tough. The, the the targets for Disley and one for Parkinson were um, batted down, and uh, the one for Charbonnet, as I say, was was technically a pass defensed. So there were there were targets for some of the players that didn't seem to get many targets or didn't get much action. There were targets for them that just, just didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And I think um, there was a couple of sacks on him as well. Jake Kerhan had a had a difficult night with Thibodeau, and so they they did disrupt us with the with you know when you think about all the passes that were batted down, nearly intercepted, the couple of sacks, the passes defensed on on uh, the pass defensed on um, Charbonnet. Um, 
as soon as you start to factor that in, they did stop some of our offense. They did manage to stop some of our offense. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a far tougher time stopping our defense. Yes, they did. <laughs> and, our, and our special teams. But they did interact. They did manage to make uh, Gino's life a little bit difficult. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that we had to swap swap quarterbacks due to an injury as well meant they were getting to him. So um, I give Giant the Giants credit for giving Gino uh, a test. Yeah, I mean, like I say, Thib- Thibodeau's a, a, a really talented player. Two sacks for him. Um, you can see why he was taken in the first round. Very versatile weapon um, that mm-hmm. you've got to account for. And and yeah, he, he's going to give most offensive lines problems. Um, for me, like we've said all kind of seasons, certainly in the preseason, um, one of my big things that I kept kind of saying is that I feel more confident and more comfortable with this year's version of Drew Locke than last year's version of Drew Locke. I thought he looked a better quarterback in the preseason. He looked like he'd gone away and improved on not turning the ball over, being more accurate, being more kind of responsible with the football. Um, And I thought two for six looks a bit harsh on him. Like you say, that Jackson Smith and Jigba one, I've got to be honest, I thought Jackson Smith and Jigbert as a first round pick maybe should be catching that ball. Um, it wasn't a perfect ball, but it was certainly should have been within his radius and he, and, he, and he hasn't made it in. Maybe that's just a confidence thing and because of the lack of balls that he, that he is being able to catch at the minute. He's just, his, his hands are a bit cold in that, in that kind of regard. Um, so I thought two for six looked a little bit harsh on him, but that fan, well, it, it, that throw to fan, I should say. Um, it was, it was. Let's have it right. It was mainly Noah Fant getting him those sixty-three yards um, due to his unbelievable footwork down the sidelines. Um, but what did we make of Drew Locke in terms of what what we what we saw from when we came in? Because I think my takeaway is before I hand it to you is that if in the future this season, if this needs to happen again, I have enough confidence in Drew Locke and the way that we are going to use Drew Locke and the things that we're going to ask him to do. I'm confident enough that Drew Locke will keep us in games. It's not going to be a position where Drew Locke comes in and we all as Seahawks fans sit there watching it go, oh, well, that's the game then. If we're, if we're trailing or if we're losing, you know, that we, we all turn around and go, oh, well, well, that's game over then because Drew Locke's in. He's not going to be able to keep us in the game. I, I look at him and think, you know what, he's... he's He's one of these, he's Tyler Heineke. He's one of those kind of quarterbacks that can come into a game and it doesn't mean that the game's over when he's in. He can still put you in positions and put the offence in positions to win games and score points. Mm. Um, That's what he looked like to me. I don't know whether you agree. Yeah, um, there's a few things I'd say on this. Um, Coming into the season, I'd have said that Gino has a better deep ball. I'd say that was one thing he'd have over him. But We've seen so far this year, Gino hasn't been able to do, you know, perform that that trick. So um, that's one one advantage that seems to have been scratched off. Um, I thought Drew Locke looked a, a, a real handy weapon with his legs. You know, he did one of the one of the first things he did was snap off a first down. Uh, I think it was eight or nine yards um, mm-hmm. to get to collect a first down as well, which looked which looked as good, if not better, than than the way Gino's been doing it. So, in terms of mobility, in terms of the deep ball, I don't think we lose anything at all. What what Gino does have, which which Locke does not have, in, in my in my eyes, is um, the ball placement. Um, you know, hitting the numbers, putting the ball where where um, defenders can't can't get a hand on it. You know, trying to give as many advantages as possible to to the receivers and and take those advantages away from defenders. Gino does that quite well, and I think when you looked at the way Locke was was spraying the ball around, it was a bit loose, and that might be a little bit harsh because he's literally not played, and then he's come in and mid game it's not like he had the it's not like he knew he was starting today because of an injury and he could warm up properly you know thinking he's playing and get his head right it was just right off you go and you know go, go and do what you can so in that respect um I might be being a little bit harsh but I think Gino has that over him the the ball placement and and things so, so it's a marginal uh, thing for Gino the the big thing that Gino has uh, that Locke doesn't have as well, the really big one, I think, is is that ball security and not getting the rushes of blood to the head that that Locke's, that Locke's had. Maybe Locke has removed that from his game, but we won't see it until we're forced to see it. Mm-hmm. So um, until we until we're in that position, I'd happily just assume that Gino is is better in that regard. G- Gino seems to have really matured with with the starting role. Um, and 
I'd hope in a situation where Locke came into the the fold, if it were, he was there for say the the, the remaining season because of a career not a career ender, but season ender for for Gino or. Uh, a few games out and he played a few games in a row. I'd like to think they would put Locke in a position where um, he doesn't take too much risks. He prioritizes the run game, takes the short completions, tries to march the ball steadily down the field and then use the deep ball if it presents. I don't, I don't think we want to be putting Locke in a position where the whole playbook's open to him and he can start slinging it at this point. If he's in there, I'd like to see us lean on the running game, lean on the tight ends, try and get Njigba involved short, you know, and then hit DK and, DK and Tyler down the field. If you restrict him to that, I think he can operate that. And also I would say this, if, if he can, if they can give a restricted playbook to, to Drew Locke and lean on the running game, and then the defence plays like it played this week, you can still be a championship side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, genuinely. I'd agree with that. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that totally. Um, I'm going to transition to Ken Walker because I, I want to get through this offence as quick as we can because there's just so much to pack in on this mm. defence, so many people to highlight, and that is the real yeah. story of this game. Uh, but Ken Walker, we can't not say anything on him 17 carries 79 yards 4.6 average and that little one yard touchdown from the goal line um do you know what it is for me this game summed up why you pay running backs in the nfl and why the running backs are so keen um for for to get their point across as to why they deserve their 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 bag when when the time comes um when offenses certainly passing games break down and don't work if you don't then have a running game to lean on and bail you out, that's when offences just completely crumble. Um, whereas we were able to show that, OK, our, our passing game wasn't working as well as it is, 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 is the, you know, that we're normally used to seeing. Um, so what can we do when that's not working? We can go and lean on Ken Walker to go and go, have 17 carries, have a 79-yard game and get a touchdown for us and, and keep our offence somewhat moving on the ground when it's not moving in the air. Um the Giants, obviously Saquon's not there. Matt Breida has to come in. Matt Breida, with all due respect, isn't a Ken Walker. Um, he's not. He's, he's a running back three, running back two at best in the NFL. Um, so when the Giants' passing game inevitably broke down against our secondary because Daniel Jones is is pretty shit, to put it kindly, um, and to put it kindly as well, their receivers are pretty shit, um, they don't have a running back to lean on. Um, and... and, and the running game can't pick up the slack and and that is that 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 game this game shows you the value of the running back if you don't understand the value of a running back in the nfl and having a good running back and a good running game in the nfl in general this this game is a perfect highlight seahawks showed you why it's massively important to have one the giants are showing you why it's massively important that you that you when you have one you keep them around because that offense without saquon barkley i mean saquon is their entire offense and, and he's showed that and, and, and Saquon will be the most happy Giants player on, on the on the Giants roster at the minute because he's proving his point. He's proving the running backs as in as a wider committee's point to the NFL, to the NFL fans that look, this is why this is how important we are. This is our value because that Giants offense was nothing without Saquon Barkley and their, and their running back. Um, and our offense was everything with 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 Ken Walker when it wasn't working through the air. Um so massive, massive props to Ken. I mean, this kid is just, uh, he could be anything he wants. He could be, a, and, and a, he will be a top five running back in the NFL for, for the, the large proportion of his prime of his career. Um, obviously, new talent comes in every year. But, I mean, seriously, this, this <laughs> I just, he just shines every week. He just shines every week, even when we're not great. He, if anyone shines on the offense, it's just always, he always, always shines. Um, even in our sort of dampest days on offense, he's, he's such a star. Um, so any, any thoughts on Ken from that game before we move on to the defense? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll briefly touch on it. I, I thought it was probably his least effective game of the season so far. Mm. And it was still good. And he still went for seventy nine. Yeah, it was still good. Yeah, that's the thing. Like you say, even on your worst day, if you if you're that competitive, even on your worst day, you are you are genuinely a star. And yeah, um, he's he's really he's really started to um to see the game 
at a speed that allows him to make adjustments, reassess, and, and attack. Um, it, it's almost like a quarterback having reads to progress through. It's like he's, he, he seems to just see multiple different options for him to attack and cycle through them. And doors seem to get shut in his face sometimes by defenders and he'd just go to the next door, you know, and it's, it's a very fun thing to watch. And um, sometimes he takes it to the house. Sometimes he rips off the 20, 30 yards. Sometimes he gets five when he probably should have lost a few. So I'm loving to watch it at the moment. I think he's like you say, he's superb. Um, and I think the backup job that, that's being done by Charbonnet is really allowing him um, to come on the field fresh every time. That this time last year he was he was being asked to play with an injury, and uh, there were games where he looked a little bit absent, or you know he didn't look fresh, or he was ha- a bit haggard. Mm. Every time he steps on the field at the moment, he's fresh as a daisy, and it's because Charbonnet's doing some of the hard yards for him, and Charbonnet himself is just as exciting doing them. So. It's a joy to watch, even on a bad on a bad offensive display. Both of them really turned up, so I'm really happy with that situation. Yeah, the, 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 like we say, them two as a one-two punch are a absolute force to be reckoned with for many years to come, and they will continue to carry our offense when it needs to be carried. On on that subject, actually, before we before we move on, are you aware that um, there's potential changes to the collective bargaining agreement with running backs? So when they entered the NFL. Um, they would get the, the idea is they would get a year less on their contract than other positions, mm. meaning that the year that they end up um, negotiating a new deal with their team or being traded to a different team to sign a new contract would come that year earlier, meaning that teams signing a running back to their second year would be negotiating with them at the ages of 24, 25, meaning that they could sign a new deal and be playing for a team until 28, 29. Whereas at the moment, nobody is signing a 27 year old, a 27 year old running back to more than a year or two, which I think is giving shorter careers to running backs. I think one, we're very lucky to have got Charbonnet and Ken Walker before that, honestly, and two, I think it's a superb initiative mm-hmm. because they have the shortest shelf life of any position in the NFL. And it, if we want that position to be attractive to players in college so that some of the best athletes are honing their craft at that position and keeping the, the NFL exciting, I think there does need to be a, can, a, a, a carrot dangled. If yeah. you, Especially if you're a running back being taken by um, a less competitive team. You know, if you're a running back, you might think, well, I might get go to a horrible team, but I only have to be there for three seasons and then I can be on the trade block and off to the, you know, the Chiefs or uh, mm-hmm. the Eagles or, you know, I think it's genius. And I think it will really, really solve the issue um, with running backs and their, you know, in their pay. Interesting. I had not uh, I'd not seen that. So that is an interesting outlook on potentially the future of uh, of that position. Like you say, thankfully, we're not going to have to worry about that. That's hopefully for the next <laughs> few years with the uh, with Ken and Zach. Yeah. Um, but it's almost it's almost like Pete knew it was coming and picked that yeah, that, that another second round running back before it happened. Maybe and everyone did. was complaining about it. Yeah. Pete knows best in Pete. We trust in Pete. We trust um, defense. Here we, here we are. Go. We got to them. Um, I've got to start by, normally I go through each player individually, but I'm going to give a props to the entire defence um, to start with 11 sacks, two interceptions, three points allowed, obviously, and four different players with multiple sacks. I don't know when that's ever happened in a Seahawks game before. Um, just just ridiculous. Bobby Wagner with two sacks, Devin Witherspoon obviously with two sacks and the interception, and what an interception it was. Jordan Brooks with two sacks, Uchenna Nawasi with two sacks, Super Mario with a sack, Miles Adams with a sack, Boye Mafia with a sack, and obviously Quandre Diggs with the interception as well. Um, I've, we've got to start. We've got to start with Devin with a spoon. Like I say, we always try and start on the D line, but I, 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 he's just the talk of the town. He's the talk of the NFL now because he's he's showed out on on prime time. Um, Ninety-seven yard pick six, two sacks, three quarterback hits as well, seven tackles. I mean, but. But Mitch, <laughs> Mitch Jalen Carter, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, Jalen, you know, Jalen who? Jalen who? Oh, I got. Can I just 
Just check. Jalen Carter's got eight tackles, one and a half sacks, zero pass breakups so far this season. Devin Witherspoon um, has 21 tackles, two sacks, and three pass breakups. So he's got more sacks than Jalen Carter has this season. He's got more tackles. Um, but, you know, we can't. I, I I I don't know if you I don't know if you were like me, Mitch, but when that pick six went in, I wasn't in, I wasn't happy at all because that should have been Jalen Carter out there. You know what I mean? It, 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 it's a void pick six. He shouldn't be yeah, out there. And, and I'll add I'll add to this right. I, I worked this out um, and put this on Twitter earlier today. Um, currently, Devon Witherspoon, after his three games, right, puts him on a projection for the season of right. Are you ready for this? Oh yeah. One 100- hundred. 130 tackles, Fuck. 23 passes defensed, 12 sacks, six interceptions, and that's just based on three games. That I mean, I, I know we, we don't get to play the Giants every week, and we need to remember that, mm-hmm. or the Panthers. Um, but that is some that is some going. And, and also, the other the other thing is, he was undermined in preseason by um, holding out on his contract and then the hamstring niggle and people wondering whether he was going to be injury prone all of his career. I'd like to point out that in the three games he's been fit for, he's played 100% of the defensive snaps. There you go. In two different positions. Mm-hmm. And but he's the first Seahawks cornerback ever to have two sacks in a game. Two sacks and a pick six, right? I think was the stat. Is that right? Or was uh, it two picks? I think it was just two sacks. The first con- oh, first Seahawks. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm, mixing up, I'm mixing up two stats. So it was the first Seahawks player to get, sorry, two, first Seahawks cornerback to get two sacks. Yep. But it was the first, or the second, no, the first time in NFL history that a defensive back had a pick six and two sacks in a game. So he has his own NFL um, first in his rookie mm. season. Which is a just, superb one too. Just ridiculous. I mean, like I say, it, it, it's surely no one will still be caught up on the Lions thing. But like, he's just proven every week how 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 good he is. Why he was taken at number five. Like I say, that pick six. Yes, it was a bad throw by Daniel Jones, but it's a it's a very very smart IQ jumping around from Devin Witherspoon. He knew, like you said, mm-hmm. he, he knows exactly what Daniel Jones is doing. He knows that he's going to stare down his primary receiver and he jumps it and he takes it to the house. Dewey Love showed some burners on that return as well, by the way, and Madden needs to up his speed. <laughs> he came flying out of nowhere like, I want to be on the camera, I want to be on the camera. It, um, it was almost it was almost like he used to play for the Giants yeah. and he wanted to have some kind of say in their misery. Yeah. So he wanted to get a block for that pick six. It almost, Just made sure that Giants fans could see him on the TV doing something and helping out going oh, this is me this is me um but yeah no i love it um did you see did you did you see his his comment um uh, post game about about that when um they clocked uh devon witherspoon at 20 over 20 miles an hour and they'd on that on that return and they'd clocked um Tariq, um <laughs> They 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 clocked Reek at twenty two point two five miles an hour, which was the fastest uh, anyone had run um, this season in the NFL. And Jordan 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 Love didn't get a shout out, but he was keeping up with both of them. And he, he was, was trying to make he was trying to make the point that at one point he'd gone past Weatherspoon, so he was somewhere in between the two. So there was there was kind of a like a a little a little street race going on there between the three of them on that return, which I particularly enjoyed. Brilliant. Ah, oh, just, just, just brilliant. Like I say, Ree didn't really sort of no flash points for 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 him in the game, but has, has played another excellent game, locking down his side. Um, let's um, let's let's give our props as well to to Quandre Diggs for that interception. Um, mm-hmm. just doing doing stuff that he that he always does. Um, doesn't come down and get sacks or anything like that, but just holds the fort down in in that free safety role as he always does. And he loves those overthrown picks. Quite, he's a, he, do you know, he's a, he's a, he's a master at picking overthrown balls. He just like, I know it, it's, it's a general thing with free because you know quarterbacks are trying to hit guys. That's where they are. Yeah. That's where they are. But it just, it, it seems like he's just got a knack for just finding the the overthrown ball, finding the loose ball, and just taking advantage of it. Um, and Daniel Jones threw him a gimme, and 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 he gets the pick. Um, but man, this. This secondary, and it's why we get so frustrated with with this defense at times uh, when they're giving up yards and giving up points because we just know how talented they are, and it's just such yeah. a, such a shame at times to see them either being misused or or, or sitting off teams. And and you saw it 
it's almost like they're listening to this podcast as we always joke around but <laughs> we, we we said that you know let, let's just see our our corners let's see Devin Witherspoon getting up there and being aggressive let's see Reek getting up there and being aggressive instead of playing softer coverages just just why why put a saddle on a on a on a Ferrari and and you've got one in Devin Witherspoon and and just just take the leashes off him he's a number five pick you, you don't play safe with a number five pick just let him run riot let him do what he does because it wasn't just the sacks I mean he, I can't remember it, it was the running back wasn't it that he just absolutely leveled at the line of scrimmage was it Breeder or, or the other running it was, back it Bre- was he he'd he'd fitted up a gap <sighs> thought he was he was going to rip off five yards. And he just slotted straight into that gap and said, no, it was great. I, I was listening to Jackson Bevan talking about, um, about Witherspoon today on the, on the Cigar Thoughts podcast. And he said something really interesting. And it, what he'd said was he'd, he'd seen a lot of people since that game talking, a lot of big names talking about Devin Witherspoon. And he'd heard, he'd heard Sherman mentioned and he'd heard... Um, He'd heard Dion Sanders mentioned as well uh, about making the guy that he's covering disappear and making flashy plays and and having that attitude about him and that edge. And he said that for him, the real comp for Devin Witherspoon when he plays the centre of the field was Earl Thomas. And he said the reason he thought a young Earl Thomas was a good comp for Devon Witherspoon is Earl Thomas relied on instincts to put himself in. He'd read, he'd read it. He'd instinctively move himself to where the offense were going to be going. And he'd, he'd often get there before the offense had got there and be there mm. to instantly make a play and allow nothing. And how many times did we see Witherspoon, whether it was, you know, the ball hits the receiver's hands and he's just bang, lays him out, you know, mm-hmm. um, making plays behind the line of scrimmage, um, you know, fitting the run play as well. Just he puts himself so quickly in position to blow stuff up. Earl uh, Thomas is a great is a great comp. I think it's, it's a, a really good comp. comp. It's a great comp. Um, it, it, a corner the size of Devon Witherspoon should just not be levelling running backs like Matt Breed. He shouldn't be levelling running backs standard. He shouldn't be levelling mm-hmm. people that size standard. But he just loves it. He, he, he just yeah. he, he lowers the boom, and he's just such a throwback, and he's such a such a kind of. It's almost like they brought him in as a way to honour the the Legion of Boom because it's the tenth anniversary. Do you know, it just feels like they've they've thought where 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 can we find a thumping thumping cornerback, ball hawking cornerback to almost echo and honour the Legion of Boom, and they found one in in Devon with a spoon um, yeah. because he just he, he just reminds me of those days every time I watch him, and and he's so so good, um, and he's only going to get better as we keep saying um, linebackers. Absolutely ex- exceptional. I'll be mean, Bobby Wagner. I don't need to tell you all how good Bobby Wagner is, but 17 tackles, two sacks. I mean, seriously. Um, but John Brooks, because we all know we all know how good Bobby Wagner is. Um, we don't need to spend too long waxing their call on Bobby, even though we should, but we just it's just standard. Bobby is Bobby. We all know this. Um, but Jordan Brooks coming off that ACL to get two sacks, got 10 combined tackles. Um he also got the fumble recovery as well and an 82.3 PFF grade from the game. Um, that we, he's, he's still, when when the injury happened and we got, we got the time frame, he still really shouldn't be on the field. We all thought he still wouldn't even be on the field by this point and he's, and he's played every game and he's looked excellent in every game. I, I, I mean, shout out to whichever surgeon and doctor have, have worked on him over the, over the summer and since his injury because you, you need to go right to the top of your industry. Um, because the, the the guy looks like fucking Superman out there. Um, I don't know what it's they're almost, putting in. It, yeah, it's almost like they've given him some upgrades, uh, yeah. you know, instead of just fixing him. It... He, he's exceptional, and I just thought he deserves a massive shout out because again, stuff in the run. Matt Breeder only got thirty yards rushing on fourteen carries. Um, what 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 did you make of the linebackers from from that performance? Because they just keep just keep getting better every week, as well as the cornerback. Yeah, I think. I think the game I think the I think the game's been a bit simplified for for the linebackers. Certain certainly um Bobby's job has been a bit a bit simplified. I think they've allowed him to focus on the good things that he does. And I think they've removed some some of the duties from um from Jordan Brooks and they've allowed Jordan Brooks to do more of the stuff that he's always done well. So um that's been that's been really interesting to see because you've just got two guys who are really potent at what they do, doing what they do best. Um, 
and I, I think I think you're just getting a, a like a really a really good look at uh, a Hall of Fame middle linebacker and a guy who's got all the talent in the world. Um, you know, being allowed to just just play play down downhill and um, and just play to his strengths. I think they just look they look superb. They look right in their element last couple of weeks. Yeah. Jordan Brooks Hall of Fame or Bobby Wagner? Let's say both. Let's say both. Well, let's say, I was thinking, does, <laughs> let's he, does, he mean, does he mean Jordan Brooks? Yeah, well, I mean, here's, he's certainly... Here's, here's a question back to you, sorry, on, jo- on Jordan Brooks then. With it being a contract year for him and us not taking the option, mm-hmm. with the way he started, can you see a world where we don't have him playing for us next year? No. no. With, all, with all the cap space we've currently got, they've freed up that cap space, we'll carry cap space into next year. We'll see, obviously, what they do in terms of releasing guys. Maybe they move on from a Jamal Ma- Jamal, Adams, Jamal Adams at the end of the season um, <laughs> because that guy can't stay on the field. Uh, poor, a quick venture for Jamal, like I say. Only, only he would wait that long to come back, get a concussion on the first series, and then he's back off the field again. Um, that was the biggest anticlimax um, since uh, since the Barbie film. Um, but I tell you what, um, if 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 Jordan Brooks doesn't come back to the Seahawks next year with the way he started again, now the only thing that would throw this into question is if he goes down with another ACL injury. Then you've got to think, do we? And it's and it's it's a shame, but do do we do we risk sort of you know paying him again after if you know touch what he doesn't but if he was to get another injury like that but if he doesn't and he stays healthy i mean the the, the guy looks even better i mean we all know how we all knew especially pairs and, and stuff like that that we preach on this pod we're a bit of a jordan brooks fan club um but we all knew how good he was before that injury in his first few seasons with the Seahawks. This season, I think he's playing as good a football. He's, as He looks as good as he's ever looked for me. He looks even better than than I've seen him. Um, and and getting agree. two sack games and, and, and just not just the sacks, but the, the, the run defence and the and the dropping into coverage. He looks such a better player. Um, it looks like he's used that kind of time in that, in that rehabbing to really maybe go and study the game a bit more and study what he needs to do and work with the coaches a bit more. Um you know, rather than just being out there on the field all the time, maybe you spend a bit more time, you know, being allowed a bit more time in the in the film room, working closer with coaches and stuff. It, do you know, to kind of see what oh, I'm I getting know. at a little bit? I, I absolutely know what you're getting at. I think I think there will have been, um, with, the, with the character he is, with him not being able to be out there practising, mm. he, he will definitely have, have been in the playbooks, been bending the ear of the coaches. And I think also, if you, if you look at this from the angle of... This is kind of a two-pointed thing here. I was going to ask you this question, but I'll kind of ask, answer it myself as if you'd asked me. Um, before he got injured, he was he had the green helm, he had the green dot on the back of his helmet, which means he is the mouthpiece of the def- of the defense. Everyone's looking and listening to him to to guide them and to to make to you know to make uh, all the assignments and move people around. And uh, I think that diluted him quite a lot. Mm. I think I think with Bobby gone. And him being in that in that role, I know that's always going to be big big shoes to fill um, with the things Bobby did on the field. Before you factor in him organising that defence, he doesn't have the green dot on his helmet now. Bobby does, and Quandre Diggs does. I think they're the two defensive captains, aren't they? This year, Diggs and yeah. yeah. So those are the guys with the, with the microphone in their helmets. Uh, Jordan Brooks is just listening and being pointed. You know, defensive coordinators telling him what he's doing. Bobby next to him is telling him if there's any changes to that. And ball gets snapped, and he's off, and he's and he's just using his talents um, and his instincts um, in that moment. He's not having to look at anyone else or move anyone else around. Mm. That I think will add ten to fifteen percent onto anyone's game. Being able to just focus on what they're doing and not having to coordinate ten other players, right? So there's that factor. But like you say, there's also the fact that he probably knew he hadn't done the best job of that, and he probably thought, "Well, Bobby's back this year, but I may well still be here when Bobby goes." And when that happens, I want to know our playbook better, and I want to be able to do that job better than I did it before. So there could be the case that he's relieved of those duties now, so it's helping him. And he's also looking at being better at it when, you know, when when the dot's back on the back of his helmet. Mm. So there may well be a lot of homework going on in that time. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Fair point. Um, 
Do line then. This is an interesting one because there's guys who are shining and there's guys who maybe are taking a little bit later to bloom this season. Um, I'll start with a guy who's maybe taking a little bit later to bloom because before the pod, we picked you picked up on an interesting uh, video of the Devon with with a spoon uh, sack on Daniel Jones or what the one of the sacks on Daniel Jones anyway because yeah by the way he got two um, so the one way absolutely lit him up from uh, from the blind side. Um, there's an interesting look that, that that you've offered and and Matty Brown has offered from his podcast. So full credit to Matty Brown for the clip that we'll be playing on on YouTube. But Daryl Taylor, no sacks so far this season in five games. Um, obviously nine and a half nine and a half sack season last year, six and a half before that. Um, struggling to get involved in the backfield and on the and on the stat sheet um, or the sack sheet um, so far this season. Is he? Is it a case of he, he is playing well, it's just not quite happening happen, happening in terms of getting to the quarterback yet? Or, because um, I know you're, you're a little bit conflicted on Daryl Taylor yourself, um, is it is he just not having a good season? Is he not playing well? Or is he playing well, but other people, uh, he's opening up other lanes for other people to play well because of his level of play? There's a bit of both, I think. Um, there's... There's one thing with Daryl Taylor this year which has become quite obvious in a few games. I don't know whether you've spotted it. Um, I've seen it mentioned by a few other people and it's something I'd seen while looking at the the tape as well. And that is that um, when he lines up, I think teams know that we think it's a pass scenario Mm. and they'll often run the ball across him that way because him being on the field means Boye Mafe isn't there or Derek Hall isn't there with Nuoso on the other side. And I think there's quite a lot of run-pass option sort of scenarios where um, the quarterback will opt to to bring the, the running back in and run it that side of the defensive line, knowing that he's not the best in run support. Mm-hmm. And that's not a slight on Daryl Taylor. It never has been the big part of his game. But there was one moment in... It wasn't in this game. It was in the Panthers game where... Um, he dropped contain on Dalton um, at the same time. The, the, there was someone outside of him that had gone round to rush the passer, and his job was to keep the contain so that the the quarterback couldn't couldn't you know go on a keep keep the ball and run and run that side of the line. And he followed the quarterback as well as the player that was rushing, left his position and got completely burnt. Similar to the the Weatherspoon thing, where it was quite obvious where someone was at fault for a big play. Now, moments like that don't help his stock because it further adds to the um, the read that teams have obviously got on him that he's not our best run defender, and they can probably exploit it. So I think I think the jury's out a little bit on on just how weak his weaknesses are. His strengths are as good as. As, as good as his weaknesses you know he's as potent a pass rusher as you know as deep as the flaws are in his run in his run game so um he continues to be a specialist player for us i just worry that when we put him out there people know that we're expecting it to be a, a you know a, a drop back mm. so i'm gonna put i'm gonna put that clip on here just walk yeah. us through what what we're seeing here with Daryl taylor it looks like he may be to the untrained eye not the untrained eye but maybe the non-expert eye that it lo- that he loses his rep a little bit but just explain what Daryl taylor yeah. is doing here so I'll, I'll set it up I'm, i'll assume you've got this paused so people can see the positions that everyone's in feel mm. free to draw any squiggly lines or arrows as i talk <laughs> through it so we're, we're there in a very traditional um bear bear front or a bear nickel front as it turns out to be but it doesn't look like a bear nickel at the time of the snap you've got um three obvious linemen you've got two uh, three techs and you've got your uh, your nose tackle there and on the snap they're going to immediately engage uh, the center and the two guards in one-on-one scenarios and the bare front is designed to avoid uh, the opportunity for double teams so those two tackles are going to be left on an island and the two outside linebackers are going to directly try to engage with those tackles so the full offensive line and the full defensive line are going to be engaged with each other in one-on-ones luckily for us we've lined up like this when they're in an empty set meaning that they don't have tight ends strapped onto the edge of that offensive line to help out and pick up any other rushes, as it turns out to be pretty fatal for them. And the other thing to notice here is Devon Weatherspoon is uh, lined up with a wide receiver on uh, the quarterback's blind side. Mm. 
And after the game, they state that uh, Devon Witherspoon states that they'd noticed that Jones was taking too long looking at his first target, meaning that the the wide receiver that he leaves to rush on this play would be looked at too late to notice that he'd been abandoned and was open. So you're now going to play this, I'm sure. And we're going to see immediately Daryl Taylor stunts to the inside, which pulls the tackle into the into the guard and leaves a huge channel for Devin Witherspoon to run a straight line straight into the quarterback before he's had a chance to look at even his second read and has no idea that uh, Devin Witherspoon is coming. And it is an absolute thing of perfection, executed to the T by everyone, but especially Daryl Taylor, as making the making that stunt to the inside makes the tackle think that he's winning the play. He's he's got him controlled. He's pushed him into a pile. He's not getting around the outside of him, and he's won. But what he's actually done is been baited to the inside, out of the way of Witherspoon, who's had absolutely no resistance whatsoever. Perfection. Perfection. Like I say, it, it's it's an interesting look in terms of maybe um, every not everything you see is 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 how it seems. You know, Delta mm. looks maybe there that he's losing his rep, but actually what he's doing is a very intelligent player call in terms of. Stepping inside, he knows where the spoon's coming on his outside. He opens that lane up for with a spoon, and bam, Daniel Jones gets fucking. He, he meets the turf monster, um, <laughs> and um, and and it just it, it it is absolutely textbook. It's how they drew it up. Um, so fair play to Daryl Taylor. Um, he is showing signs of that he is doing things well. He's just not sort of showing up on the sexy stat sheet yet. Um, but he is too talented of a pass rusher, in my opinion, for it for him not to. It's only a matter of time. Um, but like I say, this emergence of Boye Mafia as a transition onto him, um, is just maybe limiting his opportunities a little yeah. bit. Um what 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 did we make from Boye again? Because another sack from him, his his emergence again yet again, as we as again, we don't want to blow our own trumpet, but we're going to um predicted on this podcast that he was upset to have a breakout year. Uh, we, we've said it all season that he's going to have a good year. He's going to sort of really lock down a, a, you know, a key starting sort of three down role, if you like for, for that, for the Seahawks defense. And he's doing it again. Um, only the, only the two tackles, but, this, but obviously you get the sack in there as well. What do we make from Boyer from this game? Yeah. I mean, He's doing exactly what we wanted um, on that on that edge for the ma- for the majority of snaps in a game, which is a guy that can can set the edge, stuff the run, and and get pressures on the quarterback. We want we want someone like like Nwosu on the other side who who is solid and, and rounded in 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 every facet, so we can bring a fresh Daryl Taylor in on pass rush scenarios um, to do that, and and every other snap is is a, a versatile defender on that edge he he ties in massively to the revitalization of our d line without him there it is it is a slightly different concept it's a majorly different concept honestly but luckily Derek hall is a very similar um sort of profile that that can can set an edge well and has uh the speed and agility to 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 rush off the edge and create pressure as well so mm. we've actually picked up a really good um cover guy for Nwosu and Mafe on both sides in Hall 2. So, um, but yeah, no, Mafe's t- leaps leaps and bounds a better player than than he was last year in in the respect that he's able to get pressure as well as setting an edge. Simple as that. Mm. Yeah. Um, Mario Edwards is another yeah. one that we've talked about on this podcast in terms of what you specifically, a bit of a hidden gem, free agent pickup. Super Mario gets another sack um, yeah. from the Giants game. Just again, just a really talented it, player that's going under the radar. Um, was it the strip sack that came from him? I feel like it was. I think it was. Yeah, pretty sure yeah, it was him. I think it was. Um, it was a really again, big play. Just making plays, going under the radar, but making big plays. Um, he, he's proven to be a really decent contributor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he he fits the scheme really well, and um, as I kind of alluded to on the previous play, when when I said we were in a bare front and and things, we lined up like that. In, in a bare front last year, but we didn't really have great personnel for it. Uh, we didn't have an ideal sort of situation there. Um, the key the, the key person there that was a problem in that was, in my opinion, um, Al Woods. Mm. Because Al Woods is essentially a run-stuffing a run specialist, and 
you were needing someone in there who could stuff the run and create pressure. It's now Jaron Reed in there and he's doing a good job stuffing the run and he's getting pressure and wrecking games as we saw against the Panthers. Mm. Suddenly that that's working because you've got these versatile players and Mario, Mario Edwards is exactly the same again. He's a guy who can stuff the run and he can get pressure. Draymond Jones, again, similar guy, can, can, can rush the pass, can stop the run. Exactly what we drafted in Mike Morris as well. Mm. And and also I'll I'll make I'll make the point with um with Cameron Young as I said in the pre-draft process he was the guy who was getting lots of pressure wasn't necessarily getting the sacks for the stat sheet but was constantly penetrating that line and getting pressure so we've we've transitioned the whole defensive line now to be extremely versatile and uh, Mario Edwards might not have been a an eight million contract you know a year guy he's you know he's vet, almost vet minimum um but he just fits exactly what that line needed. Hmm. Yeah, he does. Um, he, he, he's doing his job every game, going under the radar, and he keeps making plays. On the other hand, the guy that we did spend a lot of money on and people thought would come in and do what maybe Mario Edwards is doing um, is Draymond Jones. Um, only four solo tackles so far this season, um, six assisted, so 10 total tackles, one sack. Um You compare that to last season in Denver, in 13 games played, he had 47 total tackles, 24 solo, 23 assists, six and a half sacks, and one forced fumble. Um, I don't know. Is he just getting lost in in what is turning out to be a really talented, productive D-line, or is he not playing as well as he should be? Is he not setting in? Um, I'm just, he's one of these people where, like we always say about the offensive line, if you're not hearing your name called, you're doing well. On the D line, it's a little bit of the you opposite. The way around. You want it the yeah. other way around, and I'm just not hearing his name called. Um, I think he's doing fine, uh, actually, and I and I think actually um, he might well be the reason that the the smaller names are actually exceeding expectation. Um, a lot of the time, your your biggest weapon on the offensive on the on the defensive line gets all the attention, and the other guys feast. You saw that for years with Aaron Donald, with players like Floyd. Um, getting getting sack after sack whereas you put him in a team with uh, a bunch of uh, well not Aaron Donalds <laughs> I don't want to say average player yeah. because because no one really in the NFL is is truly average but in comparison to Aaron Donald I think everyone is average so um sometimes your 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 most potent and obvious weapon is a beacon for teams to scheme against and in dealing with that player they leave gaps else, elsewhere and they hope that the less talented players don't find a way to beat you and unfortunately um you you're picking your poison at the moment with this defensive line because all three guys can beat you one on one and um Draymond Jones has he's he's had that one sack actually you mentioned his stat line his stat line doesn't do him justice because um there was a sack there was a, a sack opportunity in this game where he went straight through and i think he was almost surprised by how little uh, resistance there was from the from the Giants line and he almost overshot the runway in going straight past Jones but someone else picked up the sack and there was another one where he got there and hit the quarterback he'd stumbled out of the sack and then got finished off by someone else so mm. he was disruptive he's hitting the quarterback he's punching holes he's he's attracting a lot of attention he's just not getting those stat sheet numbers um that we look at and make make judgments on in general, and I'm not having I'm not having a pop at you there for just picking up the numbers. Uh, like you say, you haven't heard his name called much, and that is uh, the first thing you look for. But um, I think he's doing a superb job, and uh, as long as he's fitting in there, I think I think we'll see other people having a much easier game. Yeah, that that's fair enough. Um, I want to talk about a point now in general, um, mm. whether it's it it, it it's defense and offense both at the same time. Um, that is. I, I don't want to end the pod on a little bit of a negative here, and I'm trying not to, um, but it's just an interesting thing that I've picked up on that maybe is potentially a reason why, obviously it wasn't close against the Giants, but sometimes we, we stay in close games and allow teams to continue to get opportunities against us. Um, and that's our penalties and the penalty yards that we're mm-hmm. conceding. It's quite interesting when you look at the amount of penalties that we've conceded already this season. So I'll quickly run through. We had seven penalties for 55 yards against the Rams in week one. Um, against the Lions in week two, we had nine penalties for 80 yards. Compare that to the Lions, four penalties for 24. Um, in the Panthers,
Panthers game, we had eight penalties for 82 yards. Uh, the Panthers had 13 penalties, but for 82 yards as well, which I, I don't know how they've got that many penalties for less yards or the same amount of yards, which that's fair play to the Panthers. Um, and then again, in this Giants game, as good as we were, as good as the defence was, um, again, eight penalties for 74 yards. The Giants only had six penalties for 45 yards. Um, what... What what's going on with these penalties? Because it it feels like we're, we're playing smarter football than that. Um, but the, the penalty yards sort of stat is quite damning week to week at this moment in time. Why 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 are we giving up so many penalties? Uh, forgive me, I don't know whether the majority of these penalties are coming from the defense or the offense. Um, I would imagine more so the offense. Um, but. I, I don't well, we've, know. It. We've had quite a few. It seems that we've had quite a few offensive um, holding uh, yeah. penalties, and we had, we've had a few offensive pass interference things. Mm. There's been a couple on DK for ill discipline, and and um, it's a blindside block on something, uh, mm. which was incredibly overzealous um, yeah. against the Rams, and there was no way on earth anyone was agreeing with with his take on it. But um, no, I think. I think in terms of the penalties, there's there's been a lot of holding. There's been some strange, um, I think there was an illegal man downfield at one point where in the yeah. in the uh, Giants game where um, someone had made contact uh, five yards ahead of the line. It was mm-hmm. a bit clumsy. But at the at the end of the day, um, if you told me we'd be playing with um, four backup offensive linemen and still conceding that that few. Um, penalties in a game i'd be quite happy with that let's not forget that um i mean we we all saw how many penalties were given up by um the panthers at uh at our place with the noise mm. and we've played now away at metlife and at um is it ford field for detroit i think it's ford field isn't it yeah both of them not very noisy atmospheres um while we we're on offense and we weren't anywhere near as bad as as the Panthers were with that. The holding calls seem to be being called um, incredibly irregularly. I don't. And in in terms of you see awful ones like the one that we had while we were in overtime against the the, the uh, against Detroit. I can't remember which one of our offensive line it was, but the the hold was awful when mm-hmm. when um, when Lockett scored his touchdown. That one wasn't given. The ones that were being given against us recently were you see that on every play kind of kind of holds so yeah. i don't know some of them no, are throwaways not the one on witherspoon no no i'm not and the one against Wither- witherspoon had one um which gave up a first down at a key point again I, th- I think it was against um detroit that might be wrong i think it was detroit um there was no way on earth it could have been a um defensive pass interference it was it was some, one of the worst decisions I've ever seen, and that one ripped that one ripped off about thirty or forty yards, I think, with with where it happened. So um, the numbers can get horribly skewed by mm. um, by you know egregious decisions and and things. I don't think we're we're t- we're doing too bad. No, it, it was an interesting kind of. Is it is is there anything to read into it? Like you say, you think of all the backups that we've got on mm. offense and on defense at certain positions. Yeah. Um, maybe maybe they are doing better than what 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 they should be doing. Yeah, and one one final thing on that. I mean, um, for two games this season so far, we've had nineteen out of fifty six players as rookies, mm-hmm. which is an outrageous number. Um, and this week we had fifteen on the active fifty six roster as as rookies. So. Combine combine that. I mean, that's that's what that's that's a quarter. That's a quarter of our roster as rookies um, through through four games and backups starting games in a, on a, on the offensive line, which mm-hmm. is an absolute magnet for yellow laundry. Mm-hmm. The the offensive line anyway. Um, add those two factors in, and I think we're doing we're doing quite okay, honestly. And that's that's something that, as the rookies get more experience, that will that will calm down. Um, and as some of our starters come back as well, I think again we'll see that that trend downwards. So, not yeah. overly not overly stressed with the uh, with the laundry situation. Good, good. Um, anything that we haven't talked about, anything players wise, anything in the game, players or anything that we haven't touched upon that we feel maybe need a mention. Um, I'm trying to think myself. 
I think um, we're always going to miss things with this game because it was just mm. an absolute circus of of um, you know feast for the eyes defensively. Every every single player on the field seemed to have his own um, at least five play highlight highlight reel, apart from Woolen, whose highlight was the fact that they just didn't want to go near him. No. Um, I did. If 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 you'll if you'll afford me a, a minute of um, just in, indulgence in our defensive line, I have written a little thesis on on what the defend the perfect defensive line looks like, and I'm just going to quickly read it for for you and the fans, if if I may. I see you've sat back and you've got your drink slippers on, get the pipe, and the, <laughs> and the dog goes off, and the dog's heard you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the perfect line and what it looks like. A perfect defensive line for me would look like a top three run defense combined with the most pressures in the NFL. Check and check. That is where we sit as we speak, giving up approximately three yards per running play, uh, which is third in the in in run defense and the most pressures in the NFL through four games at 98 in four games, which is astounding. So how do you get to a point where you're stuffing the run third best in the league and also generating the most pressures in the league. And my my theory is what you do is you pick you you pick up defensive linemen that can do both to a good standard. Now with Draymond Jones, Jaron Reed, Mario Edwards, Boye Mafe, and uh, Nuosu as uh, out out there on on run stuffing downs and uh, and on dropbacks, you've got five guys that can rush the pass around stuff the run. You're incredibly equipped to put pressure on if the if the if it's a keeper for the quarterback, and if it's being handed off to a running back, you're well equipped and well drilled to stuff the run, which which to me means that you're very rarely caught out in a position where you've got the wrong personnel on the field to deal with whatever they're doing. Mm. It also means in an RPO situation where the where the quarterback's making a decision based on what he's seeing, we're well disguised in the backfield with all the all the versatile defensive backs we've got. And with um, players like De- uh, Devin Bush as well, who is sometimes is, is in coverage as a safety or the nickel, sometimes he's a linebacker. So we're very well disguised and extremely vers- versatile with the personnel. Um, and that, I think that's that's essentially what we've been trying to put together. Like we said earlier, with with Mike Morris being drafted as a as a, a defensive end that can also play in the centre. That's what we that's what we what we picked up in free agency with um, Draymond Jones as well. Mm-hmm. Jaron Reed is is a is a defensive end. Then he's a defensive tackle. Oh wait, no, he's actually a nose. You know, it, it, you look all the way across that defensive line. There, we we've put together a group of guys that can cover each other if they're injured can stay out there four downs in a row and whatever position we have to put out, depending on the look the offense is giving, we've got the pieces of the puzzle to just assemble it and be fit for purpose. That is a masterpiece. Honestly, honestly, it's a masterpiece. It's Mm -hmm. not, you look at that um, where we sit with pressures and, and run defense, that isn't a fluke and that isn't as a result of who we've played. That's just the fact that we've assembled something that can react and be molded to whatever we're, we're being shown by the offense. And that for me is what a perfect D line looks like. It might also, we touched on um, Daryl Taylor earlier, and it might also be part of the fact, a part of the reason why we're looking at his stat line and it's slightly deflated in, in terms of, uh, where where we think he probably could be. I mean, he, we we wouldn't be surprised if he had four sacks at this point. Yeah, you know, um, we might also not be surprised because he tends to get his his sacks in bursts, doesn't he? He'll, he'll have a, a three game stretch where he where he bags five, and then he won't have any for a couple. But in reality, I think with the way we've built this new defensive line, um, we're looking to give as many snaps as possible to players like Hall. Who can you know run stuff and rush the passer? Nuosu, who's the same, and Mafe, who's the same. Um, so he might be falling victim to not being as versatile as the other guys. To be honest with you, mm. but just my take on it. What do you make of that? Um, I make. I, I want to make the point that um, let, let's give our props to Pete Carroll in a sense, and not the way that you're going to think that I'm going to say. I want to give props to Pete Carroll for allowing John Schneider to remain with the Seattle Seahawks and build this team and help build this defence, help put those players in those positions and add those puzzle pieces to the puzzle. Um, because John Schneider was very, very close 
after leaving us for the Lions, interviewed with the Lions in 2021, if you cast your minds back and remember that. Um, obviously, Pete, at that moment in time, weren't drafting very well, weren't adding players to the roster very well, weren't doing particularly well in free agency. Um, and Pete sort of, you know, was getting a little bit too powerful in the in the draft, in the way that decisions are made in terms of player recruitment, who comes in, who goes out. John Schneider obviously had a little bit of a falling out, goes and interviews with the Lions, doesn't get the job. Pete holds his hands up and says, OK, I see your points. I want you I want you to stay here because I, I, I value you. So you're going to have more of a say now in the draft. You're going to have more of a say in, in the recruitment model than who we bring in. And since that point, we've nailed two drafts. I mean, we've just hit home runs in, in, in both drafts. Free agency signs have, have, have improved drastically in terms of the standard of players that we're adding to our roster through free agency um, because we used to make some terrible free agent signings. But like like it to, to, to transition into your point there in terms of building the defence, building the because de- that is Pete Carroll's speciality and stuff like that. Um, I think a lot of credit has to go to, to him for, for not, becoming too proud because we do kind of call him out for that a little bit at times being a little bit too yep. proud a little bit too stubborn in this case he wasn't he realized that i need john schneider um I, you know what i'm doing at the minute isn't really working and since he's handed the reins to john in terms of player recruitment and adding those puzzles to the pieces um or adding those pieces to the puzzle i am getting my words in a fucking right old wrangle today um but uh, but yeah, so that that's that's my two cents in terms of, and I, and I take mm. everything that, that that you said. Yeah, I think that the D line that they've just added, the, like you said, the non sexy players, Boy and Mafes, the Mario Edwards that we've brought in, um, obviously bringing Jaron Reed back is a bit of a masterstroke. Um, so I think we've just we've we've really nailed it when when I thought we hadn't. Like say I, I looked at these guys that they were bringing in, I didn't think they nailed it at all. Obviously I didn't know much about Cameron Young. I thought Jaron Reed was over the hill. Um Draymond Jones was a lot of money. Um like say Boy and Mafe had was an interesting prospect coming out of college, but he was far from refined. A little bit of a raw prospect. Derek Hall uh, is, is is the same. But I tell you what, they are starting to come together like 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 jelly now. They are coming together, they're gluing together, they're getting better week in, week out. And that defensive front is all of a sudden new also as well. It's looking like a really scary unit. Yeah, and one one thing I was going to say is when you look back now at how we drafted for the defensive line, you might have looked at it and thought a nose tackle in rounds. What did we pick him up? Was it three or four? Cameron Young. I think it was four. Four. I can't, uh, yeah, so Cameron Young, where we took him, and then Mike Morris in the fifth round, or four, no, it was fourth round, 155, wasn't it? Or something like that. Crap maths. Um, when you look at what where we where we invested in the defensive line, it looked like it was an afterthought. But actually, when you look at it now and what they're building, this this versatile um, defensive line, um, they picked really well for the scheme. Um, and if you build, I feel like if you build this kind of defense that's versatile, can do a bit of everything. It's a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none sort of situation where. You you could you could spend a first round pick on a pure edge rusher that that, that got twenty sacks in in two years in college that is just a specialist at you know you know having his blinkers on and just you know beeline for the for the the quarterback. But actually now, the way I would draft this year to improve our defensive line would be to get similar players. I find myself looking at the at college and thinking. Well, which players, which players are more run stuffing edge edge rushers that maybe have like sort of ten to fifteen TFLs and five to eight, you know, sacks? Because I feel like we want to be reinforcing what this is doing, stuffing the run first, forcing the ball through the air to the DBs, and being able to dial up pressure with the same personnel that are on the field to stuff the run. It's mm-hmm. completely altered my perception of what we want to recruit on the edge especially and also what we want to recruit in the middle of the defensive line and i think that's a big vote of confidence to just how improved it's been that i'm now looking at how we how we improve it and how we find similar players to back it up and add depth so um yeah i think it's been a resounding improvement um and it's been so good to watch oh. their their box office mm. and there's no real big names in there they're just but that what they've compiled and the way they complement each other has made it so exciting to watch. It's not often when our, our offense goes off the pitch and the defense trots on 
that you're not looking forward. To. Like, I'm, I, I don't mind it now. I'm like, all right, cool. We get to see this defense again, and I'm excited. I get to see, to see some them. spoon. Yeah, let's get to see some spoon. Get to see some Nuwosu and all these guys going after people. And it's just, I, 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 I at times, I, I, I'm enjoying watching the defense more than, than, than the offense. It's it's almost like when it was the Legion of Boom and mm-hmm. you wanted to see Cam Chancellor absolutely mm-hmm. level someone or Richard Sherman, you know, making a making a big play and getting in someone's grill or Earl yeah. Thomas, you know, you name all those names. And I used to I used to almost uh, go off and make a cup of tea when the offense were on and you know go and grab a biscuit and you know come back and hopefully we're, we're three and out and the defense are back on when I get back. Oh, we usually were. <laughs> yeah, I know we usually were, but but yeah, it, like that. That was uh, it was scintillating watching the Legion of Boom, and I'm getting so much joy watching this defense. So I'm not saying that it's going to be the same. I don't think anything ever will be. Um, but the the vibes are, are, are similar, and and I'm mm. I'm absolutely loving that. If we get slightly more fluent on offense, we, we're going to be an absolutely Ooh. superb watch for a neutral as well. Oh, we're one of the most fun teams to watch in the NFL. If, if, if I can imagine, if I was a neutral um, and I'm deciding what games to watch each week, I'm, the Seahawks would be right at the top of my list in terms of what am I going to get in terms of entertainment value? Um, sure. Because we we have got so many box office players on both sides of the ball. Um, quick look to to the Bengals game before we finish for for, yeah. for a few minutes. Um, what 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 we're thinking now in terms of? I'm a little bit more confident that our defense can handle. The, the Bengals offense because I, I I must admit I still look at it and go I can't I can't get past that it is the Bengals and it is on the road and I know Joe Burrow is is not Joe Burrow at this moment in time but I can't see the Bengals staying as a one win team for 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 much longer they they can't they can't go like it, it, do you know what I, mean? I just I feel like that they're gonna turn at some point and it just feels like it probably will be it just it, it just will be the Seahawks um that that, yeah. they, that they turn on um because they just can't they're just too talented on offense with Chase and all these guys and and Burrow when he gets healthier um I just I, I, just, I just can't be fully confident yet like I wasn't going at this Giants game. Um, because it's the Giants on the road and it's just a tough environment, even though we've, we've got sort of MetLife, we practically rent MetLife from them um, in terms of when we go there and, and beat them. Home from uh, home. Home from home, yeah. Um, but it just feels like I just, I can't, I can't be so confident going into a Bengals game. No, no matter how badly they've started, I just have too much respect for Burrow and that offense to be like, oh yeah, that's, we're going to go in there and beat them. I'm, I'm not, I'm not on that sort of train yet. We may well do that, but, I, I can't. I, I still think this is just one of these games. Like it's a trap game, and we just we just lose it. But the the, the defense have shown me enough in that Giants game that look, I don't think we're going to get that kind of performance again. Um, but that you know maybe I can't wait to see Tariq and Devin go at, have a go at Jamar Chase and then Higgins. And so I'm, it's going to be a box office matchup. What <laughs> what 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 are, what are we thinking? I, I on that last point, I think it's going to be really interesting to see. Who Jamar Chase thinks he's got the best chance up against? I mean, honestly, I, with a spoon, I, don't, I would I don't say know. because Tariq is more his size, um, and then obviously he can run with him. Devin's a little bit slower than Tariq, just a little bit, and obviously he's a bit smaller. So you'd have to think Devin, but I don't think he'll be lined up in the position. If, he, that... if they do, and we see Devin with a spoon getting targeted that many times in a game, we're going to have a lot of fun. Oh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a lot of fun watching it. And what I wouldn't want to see is them go, just keep taking on Reek and, and them going sort of having a 50 50 thing. Sometimes, he, you know, he receives it, sometimes it's broken up, maybe an interception. I, I would rather see um, Witherspoon go toe to toe. And, you know, I think that's just going to be fireworks. But um, I think one of the things that could massively play to our, our strengths is if he's still pretty immobile with this calf injury and they're showing no signs of resting him to for it to get better it seems like they're content to just manage it throughout the year that's a horrible decision for me because if they get him if they get him fit in 2 weeks rest him a couple of weeks they can save their season mm. if they if they play 2 thirds of a burrow for for the next 7 8 games or up to their bye week whenever their bye week is I don't think they're going to have a fully fit Burrow for the majority of the season, and it will be a horrible underperformance from them as a result. the The fact that they're having to protect him so much with their offensive line because he can't scramble at the moment um, plays immeasurably into our 
into our strengths coming out of that Giants game, where the defense, the, the the defense, you know, were schemed up to to keep penetrating and and getting getting uh, getting in there. Jones is far more mobile than Burrow is right now, and he got sacked eleven times. Mm. That's that's a horrible prospect for a quarterback they're trying to protect and get healthy. Mm. We're gonna we are gonna hit him multiple times in the game, whether they're sacks or just hits. He's gonna get hit. Um, and also factor in when you are trying to protect um, your quarterback as much as possible. Often your tight ends are in there as as extra extra you know uh, pickups for defensive linemen, um, not offensive weapons. And at that point, um, they're running their really talented receiving core into an outnumbered situation, um, into a you know a, a really talented defensive back room that's just not going to be stretched by the numbers. Mm. Um, so. They're diluting themselves in a lot of ways if they keep putting him out there injured. Maybe he's better and, and more mobile by the time we get there. Like you say, maybe the timing of it um, works out massively and not you know not in our favour. But I think as long as they're they're protecting him like that and he's immobile, um, all of our strengths become become heightened. Mm. Um, I so, yeah. I agree. Um, in in place of positive pairs, let's have a mystic Mitch um, because. Last week we got fairly close. I know I know Pez said a pick six for 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 Tariq because it was his first game back jokingly, even though I brought him up. Um, and obviously Devin Witherspoon got one, so we hit the post there. Um, I said John Brooks would get his first interception again. I've hit the post there because technically he did have the ball in his hands on a defensive turnover. It just wasn't an interception; it was a forced fumble recovery, and then he gets the two sacks as well. So he did he did have a brilliant game. So I hit the post a little bit with Jordan Brooks. I can't remember what his other ones were. He probably said JSN for two hundred yards, which obviously didn't come true. Um, Mystic Mitch, I want to hear a couple of your predictions in place of positive pairs. Okay, so we're going to beat. We are going to beat the Bengals, and I don't think that's. The positive. Uh, you, you've stood by that since since our predictions. So fair yeah, point. no, I, 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 and at the time I said that our our strength was in our defensive backs, which we're really starting to see flourish, mm-hmm. and I think that we nullify them there, and our offense beats their defense, and I think that's that's where this this uh, this matchup, um, you know, the tail of the tape in the boxing, you can often you can often see how a st- you know certain styles and strengths of different fighters line up in and favor one person who may not we be the. Um, the favourite on paper. I think that's exactly how this goes. I think where our strengths lie, um, their defence, their sorry, their weaknesses lie, and and they, you know, we match up really well with them. Um, the the fact that they've got injuries and stuff as well to key players only only helps that. So I stick by that. Um, I'm going to say I don't know what I predicted on the um, on the on the prediction pod from memory. However, have you got it there? I haven't got it there at all. No, I was you. Try and have a you look, but... You went straight for your phone, like you you had me quoted, uh, keeping receipts. No, I I'm going to say we we uh, we win by over a score. I think it's going to be about a ten point a ten point victory, something like maybe twenty seven seventeen, twenty five fifteen, something like that. Um, my real positive uh, positive Pez moment or Mystic Mitch as you call it. Um, I looked at our our next six games. I'm predicting we only lose one of those. It could well be um, our game after the bye. Perhaps it's not. But um, I, I really think we can be, I mean, what are we now? Three and one. We could be a nine and nine and two team. Um, nine and two? Am I, am I being stupid? I am. Eight and two. Don't you, just don't eight. ask me about maths ever because I won't help you out. Yeah, we could be an eight and we could be an eight and two team in six games time. Um, that's good maths. Four games that is good, but I haven't got a clue if you're right or not. Eight and two. Seem, I, seem well, confident. I hope I'm. I hope I'm. Yeah. Right. I'd love to see eight two. Um, but yeah, no, I think we can go eight and two um, over these the course of the next uh, seven weeks because of the bye, um, and I, it won't massively surprise me. Yeah, for me, it, it's going to be a massive sort of see where we are in terms of how confident I'm going to be. If if the Cardinals can beat the Bengals this week, I'm fully on board that we're going to beat them. If the Bengals beat up on the Cardinals, then I'm like, all right, okay, maybe they're starting to turn a corner now. But if the Cardinals can beat them this week, and 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 Burrow look and, and the same things happen again with the Bengals, I'm like, okay, maybe maybe we will go there and beat them, and maybe we should mm. expect to beat them. Um, so it's an interesting sight see this week in terms of how they match up against the Cardinals um, and whether they can play them close or not. But for now, 
And of course, we will be back to talk about that game, whatever happens, as we always do on this podcast. Um, But thank you very much for listening, as always, Um, whether you get us on the YouTube version of our podcast or whether you are one of our OG listeners and you get us through the audio waves, wherever you get the We Talk To Us podcast, we are always as ever thankful that you do. As always, you can find us on social media, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all that stuff. Just search We Talk Seahawks. We'll be there and waiting for you. Um, you can find our Discord server, as always, and as our pinned tweet on X, Twitter, whatever it's called. Um, you can find that on there. Just hit the link. You'll be straight into our Discord. Um, great little place to hang out and chat Seahawks with us. Also, we've got some fun things coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and we've got some fun Seahawks games coming up in the next few weeks to talk about as well, um, starting with the Bengals next week. So let's go and get that 4-1. Um, but for now, thank you very much for listening, as always. And go Hawks. Go Hawks.